Well, welcome to another edition of The Mind of Christ. We're continuing a section today, uh, section 61, um, that is called uh, Blasphemous Accusations and of League uh, with Beelzebub. This section is uh, Marks 3, 20 through 30, and Matthew 12, 22 through 37. We began this, our last session, and we're going to try to finish it up today. We read down through um, uh, about verse 29 here in Matthew. And so I want to continue reading in Matthew to get a sense of what we're, we're talking about here. Uh, starting in verse 30, and I want to jump right into this today. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. We talked about that a little bit last week. Therefore I say to you, any sin... Any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. And whoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever shall speak against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good, and his fruit good, or make the tree bad, and his fruit bad, for the tree is known by his fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man out of his good treasure brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of his evil treasure brings forth what is evil. And I say to you that every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. And then going over to Mark uh, chapter 3. Let's um, see where we need to pick up here. We'll begin in verse 28. Uh, we only have a couple of verses here. It says, Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies are they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Okay, so this kind of gives you some of the, the flavor of this. We talked about this before in the last section, and I would encourage you to go back and listen to that one. If you did not hear that one, this ses ses session will not make as much sense. So we're going to pick up here and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the idea of blasphemy and, uh, and what that really is. So uh, the section on blasphemy against the Spirit versus other blasphemies, including against the Son of Man. Jesus is emphatic that blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. The word blasphemy is transliterated. It is evil speaking, railing, slander, reviling, impious irreverence. So let's explore this uh, word blasphemy a little bit. Matthew 15 and verse 19, Jesus says, Out of the heart comes slander. The heart is the source of evil. Matthew 26 and verse 35, When Jesus declared himself to be the Son of Man who sits at the right hand of the power to and comes in the clouds, the high priest took uh, this as a blasphemous statement. In Mark 7, 3, 22, Jesus says, Not only do evils, um, like slander, proceed out of man's heart, but that these are what defile of man, not what he eats. Mark chapter 14, verse 64, When the Sanhedrin heard this uh, so-called blasphemies, they condemned him to death. In Luke chapter 5 and verse 21, when Jesus forgave sins, he was accused of blasphemy. In John 10 and verse 33, the Jews are more specific, the, the finding Jesus' blasphemy as a man making himself out to be God. Paul says to put away slander. And again, the word slander and blasphemy is the same word. He says this in Ephesians 4, 31 and Colossians 3 and verse 8. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 4 is interesting that it sets up a case uh, for what leads to blasphemy and other sins. The one advocating a different doctrine 
which does not agree with the sound words defined as our Lord Jesus Christ, which uh, conforms to godliness. This reveals uh, man's heart as, number one, conceited, he, that he understands nothing he, nothing. he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words. So this helps us to get a little insight into the blasphemous mind of what is going on. So again, go back and look at 1 Timothy 6, 4, because it really defines what is going on in the mind of someone who is blaspheming. And it has to do with pride and ignorance and unwillingness or inability to see one's own failings and needs all lead to speaking against. You will t we, tend to, we tend to slander uh, and blaspheme when we feel that we are right all the time, that we, are, we have no humility, uh, that we uh, can't see the needs of other people. Those are things that will lead to this uh, sin of blasphemy. Michael the archangels did not speak against Satan personally, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Uh, this is found, I don't think I gave the reference here, but I believe this is found over in the book of Jude. Even speaking against um, when deserved by the arch enemy uh, is pronounced by God, not us. In other words, our enemy, I'm sure, deserves whatever, whatever is given to him, whatever is ascribed to him. He's probably the most blasphemous person uh, ever. But uh, only God should, uh, uh, should speak against him. The word is used five times in the book of Revelation, rev uh, blasphemy, Revelation 2, 9, to Smyrna, the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews, but are a synagogue of Satan, so claiming to be something that you are not, and by doing so condemn others. There is conceit found in this, Revelation 13, verse 1, the beast has blasphemous names written on his, his seven heads, uh, taking identities and authorities not given to him. What they were saying about Jesus, um, Jesus was ascribed as being uh, uh, casting out demons by, uh, by Beelzebub. Uh, that was truly a blasphemy, but, uh, and again, is subscribing to someone something that is not true. In chapter 13 of Revelation 5 and 6, from the beast came blasphemous words against God and his tabernacle, uh, those who dwell in heaven. In Revelation 17 and verse 3, the woman uh, who is, represents Rome here has blasphemous names written upon her. <clears throat> Remember all the the designations of, of Rome and her emperors. You remember the emperors consider themselves to be gods and they would mount up uh, names like Augustus and various names. And these are blasphemous names because they were meant only to be ascribed to God. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 39, one thief ha uh, herald or hurled insults against Jesus. The word insults here is blasphemies. In John 10 and verse 34 through 36, see the complicated argument that Jesus used to defend himself against charges of blasphemy. And I would leave that to you to, to look here at John 10, 34 through 36, because Jesus here is defending himself against blasphemies. In Acts 13 and verse 45, we get another insight into the blasphemy coming from uh, where it comes from. Uh, jealousy and contradiction of what is said by Paul, uh, said by Paul, people who are contradicting him because they're jealous of him will render blasphemies against him. We speak against these things we see as a threat to our position of safety, security, etc. And so we tend to speak out against those things that we feel are a threat to us. In Acts 18 and verse 6, as Paul preached, the gospel to the Jews in Corinth, they resisted and they blasphemed Paul. Um, and Paul then told them uh, that the blood, their blood would be upon their own heads and he turned to the Gentiles. In Acts 19 and verse 37, uh, the town 
clerk in Ephesus did not find Paul to be blasphemous against the goddess Diana, uh, even. And so uh, Paul was not charged with blasphemy against the goddess, quote unquote, Diana. Paul tells Agrippa that uh, when he has, uh, when he was persecuting Christians, he tried to prove or persuade, or I'm sorry, he tried to provoke or persuade or force them to blaspheme under the threat of death or being harmed. So Paul was in the business of trying to get Christians to blaspheme the name of Jesus. Paul tells the Jews in Romans 2 and verse 24 that because of their hypocrisy, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles. And so the way the Jews were acting, it was causing Gentiles to blaspheme the name of God. Romans 3 and verse 8, some slandered Paul by saying he, um, saying that he was saying, let us do evil that good may come, which was definitely not what Paul was, was teaching. Romans 14 and verse 16, Paul cautions the meat eaters, those uh, Gentiles who uh, had been accustomed to eating meat sacrificed to idols. Uh, he, he, um, Uh, he cautions the meat eaters not to let their intention of good be spoken of as evil uh, by the way they do the good. In other words, be careful that they don't um, cause people to speak against them, to blaspheme them. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 30, a similar ad admonition is given. If I eat with thankfulness, why do, I, why do people slander me? Um, and this is, again... Uh, where the word blasphemy is found. In 1 Timothy 1 and verse 20, two men were turned over to Satan so that they would be taught not to blaspheme. So how could Satan teach these brothers not to blaspheme? Might it be like if, if they think Jesus is tough on them, they, uh, if they think Jesus is tough on them when they slander him, let them see how Satan will treat them. Well, maybe so. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 1, Paul wants slaves to know that, that uh, how they treat their masters will often determine how people view the gospel. Uh, we don't want to provide an opportunity to people to blaspheme the gospel, to speak against the gospel because of our uh, hip hypocritic behavior. In a similar um, a way, in Titus 2 and verse 5, wives and younger mothers are taught by older women how to treat their husbands and their children so that the word of God will not be dishonored or blasphemed or maligned, as other translations say. Titus 3 and verse 2 says we are to, that uh, we are to malign or blaspheme no man, showing consideration to all men. So blasphemy is, a, is something that uh, is, is taken very seriously in Scripture. James 2 and verse 7 says that the rich blaspheme the uh, fair uh, name by which they were called. And 1 Peter 4 and verse 4 says that when we do not run with the evil, they blaspheme you. In other words, if you don't go along with evil people, sometimes they will speak against you. It is okay when some speak evil against you, That's, so don't be concerned about that. 2 Peter 2, 2, when Christians follow sensuality, the way of Christ is maligned or blasphemed. The unrighteous do not tremble uh, when they revile an angelic uh, majesties. Remember, Michael did not blaspheme Satan personally. Um, 2 Peter chapter 2, and verse 12, they revile what they have no knowledge of. And, uh, and then there, there are several places in the book of Revelation where the word blasphemy is used. Again, in Revelation 13, verse 6, 16, verse 9, 16, 11, 16, 21. Um, and it, this, is, um, this is blaspheme uh, the God of heaven because of the plagues. P uh, so people, because of the plagues that came upon them by the hand of God, uh, blasphemed uh, the God of heaven. Those who blaspheme show that they are not interested in understanding or considering. They have the, their view and gain in importance by putting down another's view. 
We can be respectful even of those we disagree with. Uh, could, uh, um, could there be an exception to this? See Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, where again, where Paul takes a very strong stand against those who were changing the gospel, and uh, he says, let them be accursed. So we can take a strong stand against people and ideas without getting personal with our attacks. <laughs> so this is a, a fitting, a fitting um, reminder today that we need to be very careful in our day and age not to blaspheme people by the way we talk about them. We can oppose ideas. We can even oppose people, but we need to be very careful about not making attacks personal. Generally, the scriptures want us to be very careful what we say and how we say it, even, even to Satan, uh, and to be careful not to give anyone an occasion to blaspheme the gospel because of our uh, incons uh, inconsistent behaviors. And now to the difficult part, to define why blasphemy against the Spirit is unforgivable. Well, blasphemy is forgivable unless it is against the Holy Spirit. I remember standing on the steps of the Airport Church of Christ when a good friend of mine told me with some real fear in his voice that he had committed this unforgivable sin. He had verbally cursed the Spirit. Uh, he would often do things just to see what would happen. He felt he had really done it this time. Knowing how his life turned out, I really wonder if his blasphemy had something to do with it. I really don't know, but I, I do remember very vividly him telling me that he thought he had committed this sin. There's been very few people in my life, uh, some have, but there's been very few that felt like they had ha actually had committed this sin. I know all the uh, angels, or I know all the angles on explaining this verse, but there is always something missing I believe in the explanation. Those always seem to be a little, there always seems to be a little something missing. The easiest thing to think is to resist the Spirit who is the quickening and witnessing agent, uh, agent regarding our salvation is practically unforgivable. In other words, if you resist the Spirit who is the one who is convicting us of sin, leading us to salvation, then in a very practical way, that can not be forgiven because we are cutting ourselves off from the source of forget forgiveness. If it takes the testimony of the water, the blood, uh, both historical acts, but we don't get the testimony of the Spirit, then uh, without uh, within our hearts uh, that we are God's children, then we are a critical vote short of what we need to confirm that we are truly uh, in Christ. Jesus' death on the cross for all is unchangeable. It is now a historical fact. And if one was baptized, that too is historical. Of course, Calvinists reject this line of thinking because they believe if we got uh, get salvation, that is God's decision, and uh, therefore we can never lose it. But what would a Calvinist do with this verse? How could someone sin against the Holy Spirit if God did not choose them for salvation? If someone is totally depraved, then they are perpetually unforgiven by God's choice alone, regardless of what they have done, either good or evil. Jesus says one could speak against him, but that is forgivable. But he is the source of eternal salvation. According to Calvin, if the Holy Spirit touches your heart, it or he is irresistible because he acts according to God's eternal, unchangeable plan for your life. Forgiveness is totally God's doing. Jesus is emphatic neither in this age or nor in the, in the one to come will this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit be forgiven. Well, let's think in terms of the nature of God. God's nature of love demands that if he can save the most uh, save, he must. In other words, if God can save someone, if there is a way to do that, he must do it. Love exhausts all possibilities which are consistent with, consistent with God's nature. 
So what is there about God's nature that allows forgiveness for someone who blasphemes Jesus, but not for someone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit? They are both divine, Jesus and the Spirit. They both are involved in one's salvation. Both are essential to one's salvation. Is there something about the work of the Spirit that is fundamentally different than the work of Jesus? Is the answer in John 14 through 16? In John 14 and verse 17 says, uh, The world cannot receive him because it does not behold him or know him. In the context, the words are the Father's, are the Father's words. Jesus is the communicator of these words, but the Holy Spirit delivers and reminds and teaches these words within the heart. See Romans 8 and Galatians chapter 5 for this. <coughs> Excuse me. In John 15 and verse 26 says that the Spirit proceeds from the, from the Father and bear witnesses to Jesus. Now in 16 and verse 7, Jesus had to, um, had to go back to heaven in order to send the Spirit. His job was to, con the, the job of the Spirit was to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He also explains what Jesus could not while he was here. He also speaks what the Father says and glorifies the Son, not himself. The Holy Spirit is the key link between the Father, the Son, and the world, and the Christian. I want you to think about this. The Holy Spirit is the key link between the Father and the Son, the world, and the Christian, he ties it all together through truth. This is a great mystery. It is not a person. We, he is not a person that we want to blaspheme. His work is critical. I can't say why such a distinction is made between the Spirit and Jesus, but Jesus drew the distinction, and it is clear we must take great care not to speak against the Spirit of truth who mediates truth into our world and our lives, lest we be in danger of the unpardonable sin. Now, Mark says that blasphemy against the Spirit is an eternal sin. Does this mean the sin never ends? It is a perpetual sin as opposed to a one-at-a-time uh, sin. Is this like when you your CD gets stuck and it continues to play the same, uh, the same note over and over again. It becomes a hardened state of mind that closes oneself off from the influence of the Spirit. Hebrews chapter 6, 1 and following, seems appropriate here. If you read that passage, here a person has been, number one, enlightened. They have tasted the heavenly gift. They have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. They have tasted the good word of God. And they have also tasted the powers of the coming age. Now compare that to Hebrews chapter 10 verses 26 and following. Here the person is described as one who has received a knowledge of the truth. So it's important that the ones said to be in danger spiritually are ones who have great and prolonged exposure to the good things of God. The, these, have, uh, uh, these have to muster a greater resistance to what they know and have to be able to fall away. A resistance born in pride and stubbornness and hardness that becomes calloused. There is, a less, there is a loss of sensitivity. Paul has a similar warning in Ephesians chapter 4, 17, 17 through 20. The, Gentiles, the Gentile walk is characterized by futility of mind, darkened understanding, exclusion from the life of God, ignorance in them due to the hardening of their heart, becoming calloused, leading to 
sensuality and practicing impurity with a greediness for more. Now, going back to Hebrews, the person described may fall away and reach a point of impossible renewal to repentance. If you go back to Hebrews chapter 6, since the Holy Spirit is in the business of convicting people of sin, a continued resistance of the Spirit truly becomes dangerous because resistance turns to callousness and callousness to the loss of sensitivity to spiritual things and this to an impossible state of repentance, which is necessary and essential to a spiritual connection to God. These are serious matters and need careful consideration, lest we mess up the heart and separate our lives from God. Matthew includes another section about character and fruit. The theme here seems to be about words which come out of the heart. What is the heart? Well, a bad tree produces bad fruit, he says. A good tree produces good fruit. If the store of treasures are good, you will bring out good treasures. But if the store of treasures are bad, then the treasures you bring out are going to be bad treasures. It is the careless word that actually reveals your heart that condemns you. Being able to see a person's heart, to know the p positions they hold, is critical to having good relationships. Jesus used such practical illustrations. Bad tree produces bad fruit. Good tree produces good fruit. How could it be any other way? The law, can, uh, the law of cause and effect works this way. What you sow, you reap. Vines that stay attached to the healthy branch produces good fruit. What you have in your bank account and how you attained it is what you draw out of your account. Junk in, junk out. Fruit reveals the nature of the tree. What kind of tree is it? The fruit is the ultimate test. Well, Jesus uses this phrase here, brood of vipers. And it's also used in Matthew 23. These are snakes in a brood or a family. They have banded together. This banding together allows for cross-breeding. When you get a group that simply shares ideas and thinking and positions only among themselves, they tend to reinforce prejudices and biases and to recycle distorted thinking. When a truth from the outside tries to get in the brood of vipers, band together and hiss in unison and strike in concert to strike down the truth. In this case, these snakes were hissing and striking at Jesus, the one, the one uh, full of grace and truth. In verse 34, again, we're in Matthew chapter 12. In verse 34, Jesus speaks of that which fills the heart do we see here some distinction between what Dr. Bales, one of my professors in college, uh, said uh, was that there are two types of people, those, who with, those with problems and those who are problems. When the heart becomes full of evil and good is driven out, <clears throat> then the corruption has set in and the heart becomes defiled and contaminated. Proverbs 4 and verse 23 speaks of the wellspring of life and that we should guard that wellspring uh, so, because it will contaminate the entire life. The idea of treasure in the heart. We store or value some things over others. We move through like picking up things and saving them. Well, we move through life picking up things and saving them. <clears throat> we, col we collect bits and pieces of life. We accumulate uh, in life. We bring people into our lives. Often we bag up certain ex treasures and give them to goodwill so that they can become someone else's treasure. We do the same with people. Husbands discard wives or parents discard children. We get tired of things or the maintenance responsibility gets too great. We say we need to simplify 
That's fairly easy with the things we collect. Harder when it comes to relationships or to lifestyles. When you tell someone they are not a treasure, they are junk to be set aside on the curve, this rips their soul and creates damaged people. This is trauma. When children are abused and neglected, we tell them that they are not valued. They are not one of the treasures in our heart. They are often in competition with our real treasures, our freedoms or comfort or other relationships. So we seek to be someone's treasure. And we believe we are for a while, but does it last? Can treasure thinking be sustained? I want you to think through what I've just said here because the things you value, they're your treasures, whether they're people or things. And can you hold on to or treasure something for the duration or the long haul? In Matthew 13 and verse 52, two is curious because here he says, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings forth out of his treasure things new and old. Well, what is Jesus' point? He is addressing scribes, students of the law, who become students of the kingdom. They have now gone from undergrad to graduate school. If they stay stuck in undergrad thinking, they will close their minds to new things which will elevate them and make them more successful. Jesus was not saying these scribes had to reject all the old, but the old had to be made complete by the new. This is a major theme of Jesus' teaching. Compatible values, seeking, seeing the fit instead of the competition, seeing how things fit together instead of how things may fall apart. Well, then he mentions in this context here, a careless word. What is a careless word? Well, the word careless is argos, A-R-G-O-S. It means an inactive, an unemployed, a lazy, a useless, a barren, an idle, or even a slow word. Literally, without work. It means a word that is out of work, is unemployed. Matthew 20, verses 30, verse 3 and verse 6, uh, it, it talks about men who are standing idle uh, about young um, so they're standing idle in the marketplace it's the same word about young widows who learn to be idle leading to going from house to house gossiping and becoming busybodies talking about things not proper to mention second peter chapter one second peter chapter one verse eight if anyone has these traits in them in increasing measure there's a whole list of traits that are given there they will keep one from becoming useless and unfruitful in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Titus 1 and verse 12, uh, Cretans, the people from the island of Crete, are always lazy gluttons. That was a proverb that was said about the Cretans. So they were unemployed gluttons. Slow. They, they had slow bellies. Uh, they, literally, that's what it means. They have slow bellies. An unemployed word. Words need to get a job. <laughs> Just think about that. Words need to get a job. Perhaps talking about something we have no knowledge of or something we have no real stake in, none of our business. In other words, when we talk about things that is none of our business, it is like someone who can only talk about somebody else's business. Someone who is employed in their business we are not in their business. We don't have employment. So any words we say are unemployed words. Having opinions on a volunteer basis. No one hired us to share our opinion. Pro bono words sometimes are given. Sharing without being asked. I wouldn't walk into someone's shop and start working, talking to the customers, trying to sell them, asking customers if I can help them uh, in it. In, in, a, in, in inappropriate words, I, or inappropriate words, I am not an employee. And when I am, I am employed to only talk about certain things. If I go uh, off on subjects I do not know about or 
or am not a part of is not part of my job, then it is not appropriate words. Those would be careless words. Jesus says we will have to give an account for the unemployed words. We're going to render account. And this is interesting. Um, uh, this is the, the word logos. Um, is the idea here. Logos is interesting because it's a reasoned or a logical explanation. So when you give an account, you're going to give a reason or lo reasoned or logical explanation for what you did. So he's saying we have to give a logical explanation for what we carelessly say. So if you can't defend what you said and show why you had a right to say it, then you're going to be judged having a careless words. Senseless words and acts must stand up to light of scrutiny. Why did you say it? Think it. Do it. What was your logic? Reasoned explanations require us to understand our motives and what we wish to accomplish by our words. Now in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36, Jesus mentions giving an account. And again, this is logos, an extremely rich word uh, even used to describe Jesus himself in John chapter 1, 1 and following. It is something said including the thought, uh, the thought uh, behind the word. Words that pertain to this include uh, topic, uh, reasoning, motive, computations, the divine expressions, account, cause, communication. Logos would be a complete study in and of itself, which we don't have time to really uh, to do. But Jesus is Logos. He is the divine expression of who God is. His whole life on earth was a testimony, an account of who God is. Man heard the testimony and found, uh, and found him guilty of blasphemy, speaking against God. So now it's man's turn. We will live out our lives as an expression of who we are. Daily, we testify to our own lives, what we are about. But one day, we will be on trial. What if we are declared a blasphemer, one who spoke against God, where he says, I never knew you. The only hope for us, little blasphemers, is to appeal to the one accused of this on earth to accept his perfect testimony of being the exact representation of the father you see you see me and you have seen the father this is our hope he has even taken blasphemy on himself but i wonder is there one sin that jesus did not take on himself that he did not die for is that one sin blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Would this have um, would this if he had died to forgive blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, would this have ripped the fabric of the Godhead in a way that was irreparable? The unity that exists among Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? He explained forsakenness by the Father, or he experienced forsakenness by the Father, but his link back to the wholeness between him and his Father was the Spirit. Just a thought, but he did not fake blasphemy of the Spirit. He did not take blasphemy of the Spirit on himself, then how could anyone be forgiven for a sin he did not die for? In other words, and again, this is just a thought, if Jesus did not die for the sin of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, then it would be the only sin that could never be forgiven. Because how could it be forgiven if Jesus didn't die for it? Our expressions or words are the basis for justification or condemnation. That why the good confession of Jesus, that's why the good confession of Jesus as Lord is critical to there being no condemnation. 
to those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. And so we've offered some explanations uh, in this section as to why Jesus uh, said that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is unforgivable. And we've offered a number of different ways of looking at that. So I would encourage you in the last section that we did and this section, or the last session that we did and this section, section 61, is that you'll consider both of these together. So it's quite a bit of material here in order to understand the idea of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, again, thank you for joining us today. I'm glad that you're a part of uh, this. If you go to our website, centralsarasota.org, you will find all of our uh, material archived here. And until next time, God bless you. Take care.